You're listening to the Invisible Condition Podcast, a show where we talk about unusually normal things. We have a goal of putting an end to the stigma that surrounds invisible conditions by empowering voices and stepping out of fear and shame. The term invisible condition is inclusive of non-apparent disabilities, diseases, and illnesses. I'm your host, Tim Reitzma. I wanted to say thank you to everyone who's donated to Keep Invisible Condition going. If you love what we're doing and would like to support, please consider giving the podcast a rating and comment. Share this with friends and family. And if you have the financial means, please consider donating. Head to InvisibleCondition.com to learn more. Now, back to the show. So people will say things to me like, oh, well, you need to go vegetarian. Yeah, there's like six things I would be able to eat. I don't think so. You just, you just kind of have to like explain to people like just because something worked for you doesn't mean that it would work for everyone else. You know, that's not how that works. Human bodies are all different, you know, calm down. And I don't mind the discussion, but it's when people start to like push at it and really push. Okay. This episode is a good time, but I got to warn you, you're going to hear some background noise and no, I didn't add this for dramatic effect. We recorded this while there was a severe thunderstorm warning going on in Florida. So you're going to hear some of that thunder. Now, I've talked with many people who live with multiple conditions, and my guest today is, well, no stranger to a life full of challenges. Catherine McCord brings a mix of humor and honesty to our conversation. She shares her personal experiences with health challenges and the complexities of navigating life and work with these conditions. I think you're going to gain insights into the resilience required to manage invisible conditions and the importance of understanding and empathy in our everyday interactions. Our conversation is informative, but it's also a testament to the strength found in vulnerability and openness. As I said, we had a blast recording this. See what I did there? Maybe a little bit of a thunder pun. And I think you're going to enjoy this episode. Catherine, uh, we should have hit record about five minutes ago because my belly already hurts from laughing. So yeah. thank you for joining the Invisible Condition podcast. I'm so excited to be here with you, Tim. I've, this is one of the talks I've really been looking forward to. Yeah. You know, you uh, you have introduced me to a few people, one being Miles. And his episode, uh, by the time we're recording this, it's already dropped. And he is such a huge supporter, huge fan. We've connected multiple times. And uh, I just want to say thank you. I mean, you've connected me with a number of people. And uh, so thank you for that. Here I'm gushing over your welcome. network. And- I, I, it's my pleasure. I tell people, like, if you know the cool people, why not share the cool people? You know what I mean? Like, why why would you keep them all to yourselves? You know, I, I kind of, they're my secret collection. I collect super awesome human beings and I just love to share them with the world. That's kind of one of my, my favorite joys. And by the way, yeah. I, I do want to tell your audience that they may get to see Uh, One of my invisible disabilities become not so invisible here in a moment. I am feeling a little bit of seizure activity. I'm going to be okay. There's no need to stop, but you might get to see some ticks and activity. So if anybody sees that, I'm not winking at Tim trying to get a date from him. Uh, We're both happily married humans, but but you might see a few ticks, a few of what my friend Stacy calls my dance moves. Do not worry. I am okay. Well, thanks for that. If uh, if you start doing some dance moves, I'll I'll tee up some music, and uh, we're gonna have some. Have I some like time. it. Thriller, thriller, please. It tends to kind of go okay. with the beat. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I love it. And um, and when we're recording this, you're you're in Florida, and you yeah. had said that there's a storm, so yeah. we might hear some thunder. We might hear some some noise yep. in the background, and yep. we're just gonna go with it. Part of it, human experience. What are you gonna do? <laughs> I love it. Uh, Why don't you take a moment and introduce yourself to our our audience and a little bit about yourself, what you're up to, and the invisible conditions you live with? Oh, my goodness. So I am Catherine McCord. I am a people operations consultant and now an HR tech consultant, because why not? I also founded a nonprofit uh, surrounding neurodiversity, which for anybody who listening who doesn't know, neurodiversity is just a, a medically visible and or diagnosable difference in how the neurosystem works. So think everything from cerebral palsy uh, all the way over to autism, dyslexia, and ADHD, all the way over to OCD and bipolar. So it's kind of a huge spectrum that kind mm-hmm. of covers both mental uh, and physical conditions. Um, so 
I, I do that as well. And I'm also an international speaker and teacher. And I focus very much on accessibility, neurodiversity, and innovating HR. So there you go. That's the basics. Oh, and my conditions. Oh, my God. So many. Um, so <laughs> I have I have six current invisible diagnoses um, that are uh, disabilities. So I have uh, and, and I had more, but I got rid of the problems. I, so I have currently on the uh, neurodiversity spectrum, I have obsessive compulsive disorder. I have bipolar one and I have misophonia. Misophonia is basically that there are certain sounds that actually make my neurosystem malfunction. So it's it's the whole thing. It's not just I don't like the sound. I actually will have neuro responses to them. Um, and then on the medical side, I have one kind of all encompassing condition that doesn't have a name, but basically my neurons don't function well. So sometimes my heart puts on a little drum solo and I get seizure activities, which are actually uh, TIAs or mini strokes that have morphed into seizures. So that's super fun. Uh, so whatever that is, I have that. Um, I have a condition called MCAS, mast cell activation syndrome, which is very, uh, basically my body creates an anaphylactic response to unnecessary things that I'm not actually allergic to. It just kind of releases too many uh, mast cells and then I have a reaction and it's unpleasant. Um, and then I also have a, uh, a bladder disorder that's super fun. So basically my bladder just doesn't grow. So that's the basic rundown of my very 80 year old body. <laughs> Wow. Well, I, I appreciate you trusting uh, me and well, our audience, our listeners with that. Sure. Even from our first interaction, you are an open book. And even before we hit record, you said, just ask me anything. What Literally, has, yeah. What has made you decide that, hey, I'm just going to be open about this? I realized how much it helped other people. There was a situation where I was in Portugal to pitch a product that I designed and I was going to get up on stage and give a speech about it in front of this huge conference that had like 40,000 people at it and not the whole conference, obviously, but you know, a portion of it. And that morning I had two seizures and my, my speech left my brain and we weren't, we was timed and we were not supposed to use notes. I was like, dang it. Oh my God, what's going to happen. Right. So I, um, I contacted everybody at the, the event, they were beautifully accommodating. Yay, Web Summit people. Uh, beautifully accommodating uh, to me. We got up there, and when I got up there to give my speech, I obviously had my phone, so I addressed it, and I told everybody, I walked out on stage, I said, you're going to notice that I have my phone and that I'm reading my speech today. That's because I had two seizures this morning, but it's okay because I'm here to talk to you about diversity and inclusion. And then I dove right into it. And then what was interesting was people came up and responded to that and and they connected with me and they shared some stories of their own and they shared some of their fears and we got to talk about things and hash some things out and it was really interesting and then I started doing this more and more and more with my speaking and teaching and the more vulnerable I got the more impactful my messages became and the more comfortable people were because what it does is it creates psychological safety mm -hmm. and so if I want to help others I have to be vulnerable too. And I have to show them that it's a safe place to be vulnerable. I also have to respond in curiosity and not ego. And so the vulnerability and the curiosity responses have just been paramount in my work. Yeah, the, I, I'm really curious about that because there's been a theme over the last couple of weeks where people have reached out and uh, to learn more about invisible condition which I'm, I'm so grateful for i don't know how people are landing on the podcast or website whether it's through linkedin or social but i'm, I'm super grateful for it and there's a, a bit of a theme emerging where or uh, where when i ask hey do you want to tell your story i could just see a physical change in people and it's wow i don't know if i can be that vulnerable yeah. i i had somebody reach out to me and said, Tim, I wish I could be as vulnerable as you. And then that got in my head of like, oh no, am I being too vulnerable? Like, and so. Am I being weird? <laughs> yeah, am I, is there something like, uh oh, should I like, you know, tone it down and not share what makes me me? Um, and, and then I decided, no, of course I'm not going to do that. But, but as people, 
think about their invisible condition and think about, hey, I feel like I want to share. I feel like I uh, there's power in my story, just like your story. What would you say to someone who is is kind of on that fence, you know, dancing that line? Um, you know, first of all, it's going to change your your life, not not just you know one instance or anything like that. It's going to literally change your life. And when you start communicating in a more honest way, because that's really what vulnerability is. It's it's uncensored honesty. And so when you start being that honest. And when you start responding in curiosity, not ego, and when you start being vulnerable, it's going to expand your life in a way that you never thought possible. And it improves your confidence. It ultimately improves your health because you start getting the things that you actually need instead of masking, instead of just dealing with it, you start actually getting what you need. And what you realize is it's really not that difficult to get the things that you need when you are just honest and just put it out there in a confident way and just say, well, this is what I need. No big deal. Here we go. You know, <laughs> it just mm-hmm. it just kind of put it out there. Um, there is a lot of uh, justifiable fear because there is so much discrimination. But the more that you practice, the more that you speak honestly and assertively about everything, the easier everything becomes in your world and you make the world better for everybody else. I love that. That's going to be my new one of my new favorite uh, sayings is uncensored honesty because i actually went down the rabbit hole recently of what does google say about the definition of vulnerability and and it was you know basically um a reaction to try and protect yourself or there's like the opposite which is hey if i'm being vulnerable i'm going to be i'm afraid of being attacked whether it's physically or or mentally or what 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 uh or whatnot but i love that uncensored honesty and it's so hard it's so hard and and here you are publicly saying, uh, even on your website, your personal website, which we'll link into the show notes, that you say, hey, this is who I am. And you're launching um, launching this uh, event in the neurodiversity space, and you're embracing it, which is not common. It's just not. And so, again, you've, you're devoting your life to this. And um, when did you... Well, yeah. I, I had... I had a weird childhood I cried in, in, in a sad way because my childhood, I realized when I got older was unique. You know, when you're a kid, you think everybody has the same experience. Mm-hmm. You, do. you know, you don't realize. Um, as I've gotten older, I've come to realize that most people do not have the experience that I do, that I did. And so we need to change that because my, my parents realized when I was very young that I was very different. And, you know, I I remember my mom telling me she walked in, I was about three years old and I was playing with some toys and she walked in and thought, well, that's different. (laughs) That's that's a unique thing that she's doing over there. And she she figured out very quickly that I had the OCD uh, and they didn't know the term for it, but the misophonia as well. And my parents just steered into it. They just were like, okay, this is who you are. No big deal. And they taught me to use it in a way that benefited me. They taught me how to accommodate myself in a very smooth and natural way, how to, you know, ask for the things I needed and, and all this. And I was always given a lot of autonomy. I was always my own person, even from the time I was a little itty bitty, tiny toddler. And, um, then I got older I started having all the medical stuff. Right. Um, and they started working with me through all of that. And again, how to work with it, not against it, how to work with it. This is what your body's doing. Okay. How do we, how do we accomplish your goals with this? I got the, I had the bipolar kick in. Um, That was the, the hardest one. It was, I know it had to have been, in fact, I know because I've asked them very scary for them because bipolar ran on both sides of my family. There had been some scary situations surrounding it and um, they still just, steered into it like okay this is who you are let's do it let's figure this out and uh they even su- they even supported me and not wanting to medicate at that time because the drugs that were available were awful and my body was already so unique so it was like all right let's keep this you know as, as easy as possible but we still needed to treat it right and we still needed to work with it so we got a wonderful psychologist on board we all kind of started this self-mapping thing and really working together. And um, 
it was extraordinary. It was an extraordinary way to be brought up and to learn that this is just who I am and it, I'm not broken. I'm not defective. You know, I have these things that are a little frustrating. Now, some of my just straight up health conditions are not the most fun thing, but the neurodiversity side of me has such wonderful benefits. And now science has caught up to that, right? You know, Johns Hopkins, National Institute of Health, Harvard, the list goes on and on, have all released studies about the benefits of neurodiversity and the evolutionary uh, advantages. And so I think it's so important to, to teach the world that, you know, we're, we're designed to balance out. We're designed to do that. So however you are as a human, that is how you're supposed to be. So let's just steer into it. And yes, the physical stuff can suck. Trust me, nobody likes seizures. Nobody likes having anaphylaxis for no apparent reason. You know, mm. <laughs> just step outside and ooh, some anaphylaxis for you. You know, nobody likes that. But um, but there's so many other benefits and, and learning to work with your body and to work with your mind and your emotions and all of this is just such a better way to be. So for me, choosing to do this is about making sure that more little children have the kind of love and acceptance and guidance that I had, making sure that more adults feel that as well, whether it's at work, whether it's in their relationships, whatever, and just really pivoting how society views diversity and starting to embrace the benefits of neurodiversity. Embrace the benefits. I, I've been telling people recently, uh, when people have asked me a little bit about invisible condition and and I just ask people to dream with me for a moment where if we have kids or we maybe plan on having kids or we know somebody who have kids and they live with something that is not apparent, that's invisible. Imagine a world where they grow up and, and they don't feel any shame and fear about sharing with their friends, their family, their colleagues. And, and in turn, their friends and family and colleagues and workplaces just say, thanks for trusting me with this. Tell me more. I want to get curious. And workplaces especially say, okay, great. Thanks for telling me. How, what do you need to, to do your best work? And, yeah. and I, I, I said to a few people, I'm like, yeah, if, if my son enters the workforce or my daughter enters the workforce and they need counseling, I want them to be able to go to their boss and say, hey, can I get, I, I have a, an hour long counseling appointment uh, every other Thursday at four o'clock. Don't worry. It's at the end of the day. It won't disrupt. And and I want their leader, their boss to then say, thanks for telling me. Mine's actually on Wednesday. Who do you go see? And right. be able to have that <laughs> honest conversation um, yeah. and, not, and not feel that shame and not, and not experience that fear. That is, yes. and you're setting, a, you're setting a great example. So thank you for that. Thank you. I, thank you. I, I, it's, it's everything to me. And I, I think having that kind of strength and I, and part of this, uh, so one of the things I'm really big in, you know, is making accommodations into standard options. So just get rid of this whole accommodation process. It's idiotic. This is what people need to work in a more effective and healthy manner. 54% of accommodations are free, according to the, the Department of Labor. So why are they not just what we mm -hmm. do? You know, just, hey, what do you need? Just as people are being onboarded, hey, what do you need? Cool. Let us know, you know, and just have an accessible form so that if they get in the job and realize something later, they make an adjustment, no problem, on we go. And not just with tech and, and uh, you know, seating types and, and all this, but even in terms of interactions with your fellow coworkers. If you don't want to be touched, what's the problem with that? Mm -hmm. You know, or if, if you don't want to, <laughs> if you need camera off occasionally for your meetings or you, whatever, great. You know, um, that's just, that's just how we function. Um, and part of this too comes from a failure I had as, as a leader, um, where I missed, I didn't entirely miss it. I knew something was off. Um, but I missed something, a, a sense of a point of pain for an employee of mine. And I missed the opportunity. And I had what I thought were my reasons at the time to, to not deal with it. I was incorrect. Um, and it ended up resulting in us losing that employee and, it was so painful for me because I could have stopped it by being a better leader and by being more curious and by being more open and by being more vulnerable. And I didn't do it. And that's always stuck with me. This, that, that failure 
that I had. And when I found out the awful trauma that this person had suffered and how we were completely accidentally triggering it, but still triggering it um, and how we could have easily avoided the whole thing. Um, that was a real pain point. <laughs> so, yeah. so, you know, making sure that we don't repeat that kind of action. Cause like you said, what, what's wrong with the world where we can just say what we need and it's okay. Or we can just say what's wrong with us. Everybody that knows me knows what's wrong with me. Like it's just, it's just, if you were in my life, you know, what's up. And the reason is a, my safety, because it is safer for me. If everyone knows what's going on with me. Um, and there's that thunder in case you didn't hear it. Uh, and then, um, and then also because it makes for a more effective working relationship because then I can just say to somebody, Hey, I'm going to have a seizure. Um, I'm going to be a little bit late to that meeting and I'm only going to be camera off, but I will be there. Just give me a moment, you know? And, and then they understand too, that for the rest of the day, you know, what that means for my interactions and things like that. So it's just more effective. It just makes more sense. It, it does. And as a leader, I know we, we kind of took a turn into the workplace and, and, uh, you know, if you're listening to this and you're a leader or, you know, you work in a workplace with a leader, you got to start being vulnerable. Uh, there's yeah. so much data, so many books, so much insight on this. And the, they talk about the power of vulnerability. And I don't necessarily like that term in the sense of, well, if I lead with vulnerability, I can get people to do more things. Uh, I can elevate my team. And when I think about that from a performance perspective, it kind of just gives me a little, you know, it doesn't make me feel real good. But but I think from the, <laughs> from the power of vulnerability, from the sense of, hey, this is what I'm living with. I'm, I'm human. We're all human. We are, um, we're perfectly imperfect. We all have things going on, whether it's physical, mental, or spiritual, whatever you're battling, there's, all, there's things going on. And sure, you don't need to go into the details. You don't, we don't need to go there. But think about if we're able to even just give a glimpse of what's happening. Why are you, you know, for me, it was, hey, boss, uh, thanks for hiring me on this contract. Uh, I'm going to be running to the washroom a lot because my bowels work uh, very fast because I live with Crohn's disease. Yeah. Um, I have to disclose that. I'm going to start a new contract soon. And it's like, that's, that's already come up. It's like, Hey, this is just, hey, where's the washroom? I need to know. I don't, I don't care about anything else, yeah. but this is what I need. I get that. I feel that because I have to be constantly by a bathroom. So I completely feel you on that. <laughs> yeah. and, and see if you didn't, if we were working together and we, we were hiding this from each other and we were working on a project and, each one of us kept disappearing uh, frequently at different times. Where does our brain go? Our brain goes, oh, they're not pulling their weight. They're not doing their work instead of it should be, Hey, what's going on? Let's get curious. Yeah, exactly. And I love the curiosity aspect. So that actually ties into me, what real vulnerability is, which is it's not just sharing, right? Which is important and it's vital to the whole process. Right. And it's part of self care but it's also the most vulnerable thing that you can do is opening up and listening to other people. And the reason that I say that is when you respond in curiosity and you actually focus with the intent to learn from another human, the most amazing thing happens. And in your brain, your neuro pathways actually change physical. There is physical change in your brain that happens from what you've just learned from this other human. And what could ever be more intimate and more uh, more incredible than having let allowing somebody else to come in and change your own neuro pathways? I can't think of anything more intimate and vulnerable than that, right? And just leaving yourself open to that. But it's incredible, and you start to really learn and grow, and you start to think completely differently, and you start to interact completely differently, and to express your needs completely differently. So. Yeah, that vulnerability uh, on both sides, accepting it from other people, listening to other people, learning from them, understanding them, that's vital. And then also communicating your own needs. And also just like you said, to the practical element. I mean, I've got to pee constantly. Why, you know, why hide that from people? <laughs> like a lot of people go, do you want to go to a movie? I'm like, okay, look, I like going to a movie, but you need to understand something that's going to happen. <laughs> I am going to factually get up a minimum of two times. And that's if I've dehydrated myself before we go. <laughs> <laughs> so for those who are listening if we put in some interlude music we know uh, you know it's like we'll just leave it there we're not going to edit it out it's like Catherine's just got to go and we're going to embrace it and uh, yeah it's just going to happen the I... in the background. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'm, I'm having a good day though today. So I think we, we might actually make it all the way through the recording. Um, but it is, it's funny. And then the other thing too, is sometimes you have to, with your invisible disability, um, you know, there's also the trauma aspects that can happen. So one of the disabilities I, I alluded to it at the beginning that I, I got rid of some of the problems. Um, part of this, I had a hysterectomy a few years ago. And so, uh, that was its whole, whole other process in and of itself. Before that I had, uh, six miscarriages and, um, you know, having to explain that to people at work and having to explain that to other people, because people always want to know, why don't you have kids? Why are you going through this? You know, it's just, there, people are so nosy. So first of all, don't be nosy with people, please. Curious, yes. Nosy, no. There is a difference. <laughs> um, <laughs> know your boundaries. Um, it's an accept when people put up a boundary, too. You know, that's another thing. But but the trauma, you know, people people don't think sometimes about the trauma that can come with disability. And there are other, that's just, you know, one one example, but it's, it's a lot. So somebody may not want to talk about all the details. They may just need to tell you, I have a disability associated with this. And sometimes I'm going to have certain needs. The end. And then we just let that sit and we accept what they've told us because sometimes they don't want to have to explain all the rest of that nonsense to you. <laughs> you know? Uh, yes. It's, just knowing when to just close your mouth, <laughs> just, just you keep yes. your brain going, but shut this, uh, shut, shut your mouth a, a little bit. And, and yeah. we may want to get, and then we ask ourselves and I, I blogged about this, um, a few times, which is, you know, are we authentically curious? Like, is it curiosity yeah. coming from a place of, I really want to know more? Um, because by knowing more, as you said, it's, it's a layer of vulnerability, uh, do we really want to know more to educate ourselves in order to support um, maybe the person we're talking to or using the newfound knowledge to support others? Or is it self-serving curiosity? Ooh, I'm nosy now. I want to, yes. I want to use <laughs> this and, and maybe serve myself. I want to use this against someone. I want to, mm -hmm. uh, I just want to know for the sake of knowing and I don't care what else, but I just want and to And that's where I have the problem with it. I never mind actual curiosity ever. But it's the nosiness, you know, and the, well, why didn't, because this is, this is an actual conversation that I have had so many times I can't even count. Well, why don't you have kids? My body didn't want to cooperate. What does that mean? I explain it. Well, did you ever really try? Yes, we had several miscarriages. Did you ever try IVF? Oh my God, back off. <laughs> This is good. And, and what they're trying to get to is because then this is how it always ends, inevitably. Well, you really should try again because everyone needs children. You need children. You won't be fulfilled in your life without children. That's where it always ends every single time. And my response to that is actually, no, I'm extremely happy. Thank you very much. I have multiple people in my family that don't have kids, they're all very happy. <laughs> I am very fulfilled in my life. I'm happy that you're fulfilled with children. I am happy and fulfilled without them. Thank you. And then we just kind of go on. But it was, it's that kind of like jabby, you know, and I know other people that, that get the same kind of thing with other, with other invisible disabilities as well. The other one is the questioning of it. Do you really have a thing? Like, are you really sick? You don't look sick. You know, that's always one of my favorite, favorite things. I'm like, thanks. I guess that means I look okay but it's still real. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know why you're saying that. I never know how to take that. Like, are they just trying to be nice or are they trying to like insinuate that it's not real? Yeah. <laughs> I, I've heard that so many times. Like, well, you don't look sick. Are you, the, my favorite was, are you sure you need surgery? And this was a week before I needed surgery. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, actually, I'm, I've actually gone a whole week without massive internal blood loss. So I'm good. I'm good for surgery. And are you sure? Hey, maybe you should just try this diet. Somebody recommended once, oh, you know, my yeah. intestine was almost closed off and you get all these Facebook and Instagram social media messages. Hey, you should try this all vegetable diet. It's like, well, that would actually kill me. Oh, you should go yeah. full, uh, full meat diet, go full carnivore. I'm like, well, actually my body can't digest that. So I would die, yeah. but thank you. Yeah. Thanks for trying to kill but thank me. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for your, thanks for the death wish. Yeah. I just, 
I, I've had the same thing with the MCAS. I, my diet is so bizarre. It's the, the weirdest little holes that of things that I cannot have and the things that I can't. Like, it's so weird. So I can eat um, pecans and coconuts and of all things, walnuts, but not the rest of the, and, and with occasional peanuts, but I have to be careful with that. But like not cashews, not almonds, not any of that. Um, fruits, like half of them are a no-go for me. Um, it's really bizarre. And so there's just all these little things. And so people will say things to me like, oh, well, you need to go vegetarian. Yeah, there's like six things I would be able to eat. I don't think so. <laughs> you know, you just, you just kind of have to like explain to people like just because something worked for you doesn't mean that it would work for everyone else. You know, that's not how that works. Human bodies are all different, you know, calm down. And I don't mind the discussion, but it's when people start to like push at it and really push. And, um, and it is funny because I've had the people to get aggressive with me about things, you know, and they really try to, uh, to push their way. And so I always like my, my own little Catherine way of dealing with it is I'll look at them and say, okay, if you want to go down this path, I will go down it with you, but please understand that I've done all my education and I have all of my reasons and I have all of my research. And so if you're not ready to match that with something equally as on point, you might want to stop the conversation here. <laughs> and like nine times out of ten, that shuts them down. <laughs> but, but every once in a while, we have someone that still wants to keep going with it. But it also sends the message of you're hitting a nerve. You know what I mean? It's it's that like, all right, all right, stop, 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 stop. Um but yeah, it's, it is, it's interesting. And, and I have friends with visible disabilities. We've talked about the differences and, and all that. It's, everybody's got their unique challenges, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's just this whole, and then when you're invisible, ones become visible is super annoying. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of that either. I would just like to share that. I finally have started having permanent facial, uh, and you can't really tell in this lighting, but I have like creases and stuff over my eye that go like the wrong way. They're like not like normal creases. They're like a bizarre, like diagonal crease. Um, and so I'm, my my invisible disability is becoming less invisible. And I have very sour feelings about that. <laughs> but <laughs> I get super like grumpy cat about it. Um, and I think that's something too that not a lot of people talk about is how your body starts to change and not just in visible ways, but you know, when your body starts to change in ways that are not what you expected and it's frustrating. And maybe you don't look how you used to look. Maybe you don't walk how you used to walk. Maybe you don't eat how you used to eat. And it's more that you feel like you're losing you. Do you ever go through that? that where you, it's, it's not so much about the thing that's gone. It's that you don't get to be you. Yeah. I. It, as you were mentioning that, it's really resonating with me and I'm kind of squirming in my chair a little bit because I'm battling that right now is... And I had surgery uh, April of 2023, and my body is not functioning how it was before my uh, my Crohn's came out of remission about two and a half years ago. You know, two and a half years ago, I was um, I was very active, functioning, had lots of energy. Now, I I have a hard time making it through a day. If I go two days without a nap, that's that's good for me, you know. And we were talking off uh, before I hit record. It's like I can nap on command. My body just tells me, Tim, lay down, shut your eyes, and still and, super jealous about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's it's one of my. I don't know how to turn that into a superpower. Just I don't know, <laughs> but uh, um, you know, and, and so lacking that energy, um, but also, you know, the frequency of running in the washroom. I guess missing parts of my intestine, you know, it's, I have to plan out how I leave the house when I leave the house. You know, we went for a, a big, a big hike recently with me and my kids. And I was, I was just battling anxiety. I didn't tell them, but inside I'm like, okay, I better take some meds, uh, the day before the, the, the morning of, I better watch what I eat and just to make sure that I don't have an accident along the way. Years ago, a couple, like three years ago, I didn't have to worry about that. And so my body is is changing, but I also have found my voice in terms of self-advocacy. And Good. I phoned up my doctor and said, I don't like this. What can we do about it? And they're like, oh, okay, let's figure out what we need to do about it. I'm like, I, I like, you know, just 
take it all if that's what's going to give me some quality of life. Like take all my intestines if that's going to give me a better quality of life. But, you know, I can't, you know, I can't struggle with every hour, every two hours. And it could be in the middle of a podcast. Or, I don't know. Like I really watch what I eat before I record a podcast. Um, because right, yeah. It, yeah. So it really resonates with me when it's, it's not necessarily visible, but it has an effect on me yeah. mentally. Yeah. When it changes your life, how you wanted it to be. So I also, this is a good lead in. Thank you. COVID got COPD because I had COVID twice. Yes. I do vaccinate. One happened before one happened, right? It's a whole thing anyway, but I got COVID twice. Um, and it left me with COPD. And now I have smoker lungs. I'm a non-smoker, by the way. And I have smoker lungs. And it's very annoying. And I don't like it. And it changes my ability to do things. And it makes me tired. And if you ask anyone, the one thing I cannot stand, my number one pet peeve in all of life, is not having the energy to do the things that I need to do. Or something slowing me down. Can't stand it. And so it's been really hard to have to go, okay, I have to sit and just breathe. <laughs> you know, I have to stop and get some, get some of my oxygen out and, and take that or whatever it is. And it's super annoying and I don't like it. Um, that and the bladder condition are just like the least favorite of all the things that are wrong with me. Do you have a, a ranking chart like of your conditions? It's like I do. favorite. I do. To, to, it's like... <laughs> If I, if I could get rid of at least two, what would they be? Yeah. I like, yeah, there's things like I love like way at the top of like would never trade them for anything are, uh, are my bipolar, my OCD. I love both of them. And yes, they have some drawbacks too. Trust me. I think the, the compulsion sometimes get, you know, uh, but I love both of them. They, they're part of what make me me. I wouldn't sh- trade them for anything. And then like, then it kind of goes just downhill from there down into the abyss and I have more health conditions even when I listed but those are the ones I actually consider to be disabilities like mm-hmm. the actual like you know problems um you might hear some of the popping occasionally in the background that is actually my joints it's a fun new thing that my joints are doing I crack and pop like I'm popcorn um but it's it is it's like you you do kind of get to the point that's like I don't like this thing I'm with you like I'll just call my doctor and go okay this ain't gonna cut it we got to figure this one out. This is the thing. This is the thing that's got to go, you know? So for me, the main things that we control are uh, the seizures to make sure that they're not constant, that they're just little activity kind of like I've had today. Um, and then occasional, you know, big ones. Um, then it's the itchiness for the MCAS. Cause man, I can take a lot of things. I cannot take just being itchy all over my body. I can't do it. It's, it's horrible. Can't do it. Um, so that's the one that we control there. And then with the COPD, being able to breathe. Because you, know, you kind of all need to breathe. You know, it's kind of a thing with the human existence. Just something we, we have thing. to do. It's something most of us have in common. I would say, I guess yeah. all of us have in common. All of us. Yeah, we got to. You know, I keep trying to photosynthesize and it's not working. Like yeah. at all. <laughs> no experiment there and has worked. Um, but I do like my respiratory therapy. I have my inhalers. That's the that's the main one that I medicate for. Uh, that in the MCAS, like you just have to. It just there's just no. I'm not a huge like medication person, but you just have to, right? Um, or you're just gonna be in misery. Uh, but yeah, it, it is funny you brought up like least favorites because yes, I definitely have least favorites that I just I'm like no, no thank you to this. If I could fire this, I would like this would just <clears throat> be yeah. gone with you. <laughs> it's somebody I was talking to recently. It's like I don't live with it; it lives with me, and I would evict it at any point in time. It's just a stubborn roommate. It's a stubborn, you know, person it who's just something that's taken up residence. And it's yeah. like, you know, if I can write that eviction notice two weeks, I just want you out of my body. You're, you're gone. Yeah, I just don't care for this very much. No, thank you. Goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the other thing too, and I'm going to get your opinion on this. I've, I've been talking to people recently about this is like the perspective that cr- people with chronic conditions, especially uh, they in the, fall into like the disability field. Um, our perspective on the medical like system is so different from everybody else because it's just like, you're just perpetually having to deal with this nonsense just like over and over and over and over. And I don't want to get into like politics, but I'm just curious, like, what your experience is 
like in terms of like your mental, like does does it exhaust you to think of like, oh my God, I've got to go through another diagnosis or oh my God, I've got to go through this whole other process. Is that something that's exhausting, exciting? What is your response to that? I would say years ago, before I found my specialist, uh, yeah, it's exhausting. It's daunting. Um, I live in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. So our healthcare system is very different than in the U.S. And um, I have found through, uh, from, I guess, my family doctor years ago, found this uh, center here in Vancouver. It's now called the IBD Center of BC. And so I have access through that um, gastroenterologist, through my doctor, I have access to his nurse, I have access to a dietitian, I have access to counseling, and I'm utilizing it all. I just have to phone up, to, uh, phone their, their number, their, their front desk, and talk to the receptionist and say, hey, I need to see um, the dietitian. And within a day, that. I'm talking to the dietitian. Um, we also have a, a great family doctor. And so I'm a little biased in this because we have a family doctor, but I also know up here, and I, th I don't know what it is like in the US, but here in Canada, it's extremely hard to find a family doctor. It's so hard to find someone who can give you that uh, continuous care. Like I've gone to walk-in clinics and it's like, I had a hearing this problem. <laughs> no, years ago, a couple of years ago, I woke up with this pounding pressure in my in my ear. And I went to a walk-in clinic. I'm like, it wasn't there yesterday. It's here today. He's like, well, it's tonight. So you're going to live with it for the rest of your life. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like what? And so then I went to an urgent care center and they're like, yeah, it's, I, I, we don't know what it is, but here's some medication. And then I went to my family doctor and he's like, it's not tinnitus. There's something else going on. And long story short, you know, that was frustrating. I had went to hearing clinics. I saw specialists. I, I was supposed to go on a trip, a work trip uh, to Mexico. And my do family doctor was like, there's absolutely no way you can fly. Like if you've, if something bursts in your ear, you're going to be, you're not going to make it home. Like you're going to be in such excruciating right. pain. And so I've had frustrations with the system, um, but I've also had, had a good experience. And to my long to, to sum up my long-winded responses, I've <laughs> learned self-advocacy. I actually wrote an article. It's going to go live on the website. If by the time you're listening to this, it'll be up on the website. Is how to advocate for yourself and how to develop your voice, how to be firm, yes. and how to check in your emotion when you're talking with your doctor and walk through. And I even came up with a model on how to walk through this. So you got to check out the oh, the article on like. I will have to read that. I love that. And I. And by the way, I have, I finally found it. It is very tough in the, in the U.S. to find a good, a good primary care physician. That's what we call them here. Like a good primary care physician. And I found an amazing one. And it's through a system called Direct Primary Care. And she has access to all of these specialists. So we can just kind of get everything done very quickly, very inexpensively. A lot of times I don't have to have multiple appointments. She can just send stuff off. It's very easy. And that to me made all the difference in the world. Like mm -hmm. just having that one doctor and the doctor that actually knows me. And I get an hour with her every single time I go uninterrupted. That is my time. It's not like, because a lot of times here in the States, it's like they come in then they go off to see the other patient. Then they come back to you. Then they go back over here to this person. And it's very chaotic and frustrating. You have to wait in these long ass lines. No, I just go in, I see her, I leave. I can text her, I can email her and it makes such a difference. So I really have a lot of appreciation for having that strong relationship with a primary care physician um, and then finding the right specialist, to your point, the right specialist, things like that as well. Finding the right doctor matters. So interview them. Just because somebody has, you know, PhD or, or has the, the MD or whatever it is after their name should be MD for this, um, doesn't mean that they're actually good at what they do or it doesn't mean that they're good for you. Maybe they're just not the right fit for you. So interview your doctors. Mm -hmm. My wife uh, lives with arthritis. Real quick, spondylitis. so sorry. Got to go bathroom. We talked about this. Okay. Got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> hey, while we're taking a quick bio break, I've got a favor to ask. After you're done listening to this episode, would you be able to leave a rating and a review? Ratings and reviews help others discover a good podcast. And well, I hope you think that this is a great podcast. So just after you're done listening, 
take a few minutes, take a few seconds and head over there and leave us a rating and review. And we're back. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I was like, you know what? This is the show for it. Just don't, don't kill yourself. Just go. <laughs> <laughs> Just go. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I, I was, I was going to say that, you know, my wife, um, Elizabeth in closing spondylitis and has said, you know, she's gone through medical sp- or multiple specialists and she had a great specialist and, but she found she wasn't getting the, the, it wasn't working for her. And so she heard another specialist talk at an event and then she emailed that specialist and now she's with that specialist and, you know, no hard feelings, right? You don't have to worry about hurting the feelings of your, of your previous specialist. It's right. You know, you need to find that care for, um, f- that, that you need. Mm-hmm. And yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm looking at, um, just checking the time and I can't believe almost an hour has gone already. Um, I've learned so much and I've got so many questions about just the conditions you live with. And I'm really curious just about <laughs> MCAS, like, and anaphylaxis. Yeah. And, and so when I hear that, it's like, okay, so we, I typically hear it's like, a, um, as I understand it's a allergic reaction to something. So do you know, like if you eat something today and it's fine and then you eat the same thing tomorrow, would you have a reaction to it? Like, how do you, how do you? So this is what's so crazy about this condition is the slightest variance can cause the reaction because what's happening is my body is misunderstanding signals and it, so then it will release the, the mast cells. And that's what creates the anaphylaxis, which is like trouble breathing, rashes, uh, gastrointestinal problems, all kinds of things. And, um, and so it's really interesting because I'll eat, uh, now typically like a, an isolated food, it's going to always produce the same result to like a pecan or a glass of milk or whatever. That's, that will kind of be the same. But if it's, let's say a cherry pie, this cherry pie might be okay this cherry pie may make me sick. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's just, you have to be so specific. It's like this pizza is fine. This pizza is not. And that actually is a thing for me, by the way, there are pizzas that set me off and there are pizzas that don't. It's completely bizarre. Um, and I'm sure that there's some little ingredient in there, you know, but I don't want to call each place and be like, what do you put in your pizza so that I can chart my health? <laughs> you know, I think that's, that, that seems obnoxious to them. Um, so it's, it's really unusual. But the other thing that's frustrating is, I can go to hug somebody and they can have been walking out somewhere, picked up some allergen just somewhere on their skin or clothes. I hug them and then I have a response. And so it's just completely frustrating. Oh, and cigarette smoke, if you smoke outside, come back in. You cannot be anywhere near me or sit on anything that I am going to sit on because it will be horrible. So I tell people, I'm like, okay, you can have an outside smoking shirt and then you take it off and then you put it back on your, and then as soon as you come to the door, you can put on your inside shirt and then that's the process. <laughs> and it's, and it's so funny and people are so sweet. You know, people in my life are so sweet about it. Um, and if it's like a client or something like that and we're walking along and they want to smoke, I say, okay, I'm going to walk X number of feet away from you. Don't take offense. You know, I'm just going to be over here. And we just kind of go on about it. Um, Alcohol is an interesting one. Um, I cannot drink at all anymore. Um, and sometimes even people's breath will kind of get me like, you know, like, it doesn't feel too good. You know, like if it's too strong, you know, it'll, my body will start kind of freaking out a little bit. So it's weird. It's a weird condition because you just kind of like never know. And certain textures will cause it. It's very weird. It's invisible <laughs> until it's not. And then it shows up. Yeah. And, wow. And super I, I'm curious, like, do you carry around an EpiPen? Like, is it goes? Yes. And my husband is way too excited about getting to stab me with it. Like he is just waiting for the day. (laughs) In fact, it was really hilarious because we let my mom know that we've gotten it, that we actually got it in. And she goes, no, I want to be the first one to stab her. I had to raise her. I want to stab her. I'm like, why, why is everyone wanting to stab me? Wait, hold on. (laughs) Pause. None of you get to do it. None of you are allowed. (laughs) <laughs> but yes, I do carry an EpiPen. I have to carry special inhalers also for that, not just the COPD. Um, and I take this weird liquid called chromalin and it's, it comes in these little things and I squeeze it into water and down it right before I eat. 
and that helps to coat my stomach and because that's where your mast cells are is in your is in your tummy and so that helps to kind of soothe that and quiet them down and be like no thank you you are not needed <laughs> but yeah it's kind of weird that's just wow okay i learned something new i'm sure our listeners yeah. <laughs> learned something new if somebody's like and it's hey. different for everybody by the way like i've talked to other yeah. people with it and the stuff that sets them off is completely different <laughs> Yeah, it's you can't prescribe a diet uh, for for you, and uh, so it's like, hey, Catherine, uh, have you tried just eating, you know, all uh, pecans, nuts, and just drink milk? Uh, maybe just stick with that, and and uh, I'm sure you'll be fine. Like, and milk is not good either; it's terrible. Oh, no. <laughs> I, don't love milk. Or, I have to drink oat milk now. Like, yeah. what even is that? How do you milk an oat? Yeah. That's what I want to know. Yeah. <laughs> you do that i'll go ask my kids after i'll let you know (laughs) yeah Yeah, right just go ask them um but it's so um it's so bizarre and so i do i have certain things i do avoid just cannot touch um and then other things like you know citrus is really hard for me um like i said certain nuts you know etc but it's uh, spicy foods can be very bad (laughs) very bad very quickly um but yeah it's it's the most bizarre condition it is. Wow. Okay. I've learned something. I'm going to go do some research. Whatever I found, I'll put the links in the show notes as well. And, you know, as I look to wrap up here, uh, a couple things. First, I want to thank you for sharing so openly, for vulnerably, sure. for sharing some laughs, um, uh, you know, for sharing the very personal story of, of miscarriage. I know that is a very personal one. And uh, for, for people who are wanting to embrace their story, to tell their story about living with an invisible condition, um, in order to, because I believe that when we share our story, we will end the stigma. We will start to end the stigma. And I've already seen it happen. We released a, an episode on OCD and I had someone reach out to the guest who's now connected me with just a powerful story. And now they're saying, I, I want to tell my story. It's time. When you hear that, how are we going to end the stigma? How are we going to continue to, um, to end the stigma that surrounds invisible conditions? A lot of conversation and changing from making accommodations, things that we have to, quote, deal with after the fact, and changing it to everything, everything from policies and procedures to the physical design of different things to just the way that we function as a society, changing to a universal design. That's it. Just this is how it's, and it's got to be flexible because like we said earlier, we're all unique. My experience with OCD is I'm sure very different from the last guest that you have. And my experience with MCAS is very different from that, from other people and so on and so forth. So being flexible with things, that's the key. So I think talking about it, universal design and flexibility, and then responding in curiosity, not ego. Powerful. Responding to curiosity, not ego. Flexibility. Learning that the word normal just doesn't exist. And if we are able to embrace that and and truly embrace that, okay, there's some thunder there. Um, The word, I love it. I'm going to give a profound Sorry. thought here. And it's like the world is opening up ominous. as I'm ready to speak. I love it. Yeah, this is very ominous yeah. sound ominous. coming from Catherine's end. I love it. Yeah, it's, you know, I, if we keep talking about this and we keep seeing a little bit of change and we're going to see a change en masse. Um, curiosity, not ego. Embrace vulnerability. Yeah. Uncensored honesty. If we... Yeah give a bit about ourselves. We choose what, how much to give, how much to share. And for those who are listening, as Catherine says, respond vulnerably and just get curious and ask questions. So I really enjoyed our conversation. I, I think we could go on for a couple hours. And so I'm, oh, sure, God, I'm sure we're going to record <laughs> again because I think you know, just even a couple, we could record six episodes just on each specific condition. Easily. And, and there you go. <laughs> The thing's wrong with Catherine. <laughs> that would be a great series. <laughs> Maybe we'll have a little series coming up later this spring. <laughs> That'd be hilarious. Uh, it's so fun. Uh, Catherine, thanks for coming on. And, and for those who are Absolutely. listening, I truly appreciate you. I know we've accepted uh, or we've taken a couple donations now through um, visibleconditioncom on the website, which is phenomenal. Uh, and uh, people are subscribing to the newsletter. 
and uh, people are leaving comments there. So uh, I hope you feel like you're missing out. You need to subscribe to that newsletter. There's some good stuff in there. And so that's my little selfish plea at the end to um, to just continue to support Invisible Condition. Join this movement that, movement that we're creating. And, um, and also, we'll put all the links on how to get a hold of Catherine in the show notes. You need to connect with her. She is phenomenal. Reach out reach anytime out. about anything. I've got you. <laughs> she literally does. I've reached out a few times and she's like, she's on it. So with that, I again, thank, Rin, uh, thank you, Catherine, for coming on. And uh, I hope everyone has an amazing day. Thank you.